How's everyone doing today? My name is Yupari, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's portrait painting demonstration. This week's video is going to be yet another full length demonstration, so get ready for another 1 hour and 24 minutes of painting time as well as detailed explanations and some of my thought process. For my palette today, I will be using from left to right three dots of titanium white, two dots of lead white, raw umber, burnt umber, alizarin crimson, cadmium red light, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. In my little cups that you'll see me using today, I will have to the left just regular odorless paint thinner and to the right my medium which consists of 1 fifth stand oil to 4 fifths paint thinner. Before I begin I like to dip my brush into a little bit of my medium and then dab it on my paper towel and then I reach for my drawing color which will be my raw umber. In the beginning I like to make a general placement for the top and the bottom of the, the head uh, just to give me a, an idea of where things are going to be placed in space and then I work around those two marks and try to identify the general big shape of the head. Nothing too accurate right now, I'm just trying to get a general idea of where I'm going to place the head. I like to say this a lot, um, the beginning of a portrait painting is really an exhilarating experience where you're energized and you're making your first marks and you don't quite know what's going on yet and it's it's a fun experience um, but it can also be kind of terrifying as well because especially if we're painting somebody that we're familiar with we want to get their likeness and we want to make them look pretty or, or whatever and that's really something that I try to tell myself that that's not really what I'm after in the start I'm after just trying to try to get something down on the surface uh, as far as technique, all I have really is an outside shape, a center line, and a mark for the axis of the nose, and the axis of the eyes, and another shape for the beard. That's all I have. And I'm trying to be loose with it. I'm trying to be organic with it. I'm not trying to have it be something like so precise, so this is a mark that I'm making and I'm sticking with it. No, rather, I'd rather start with something that is basic and something that I can work with to facilitate in future steps and to build accuracy on top of. I constantly strive to make my paintings more and more simple. Uh, believe it or not, Making things simple is actually not that simple to understand initially. Um, and I've been doing this for several years now. And I think that for me, in the beginning, if I have just a general outside shape that's accurate enough, and I have three blocks, say the block for the for one orbit of the eye, another block for the other orbit of the eye, and then another for the nose, I can generally work with that because if I have the right shapes in the right place relative to each other, it doesn't need to be so dead on precise because it's like a building block. I've kind of created a sort of working space, like a perimeter of which I can work around. And for me, the goal is to do that in a rather loose and gestural way. Notice how I make these marks. I'm just like putting a simple brush mark to indicate each feature at the moment. I don't want too much specificity right away. I just want these simple shapes to relate with each other because I know that in future steps I can build more and more precise shapes on top of them. As far as uh, the medium that I'm using, 
I have my bristle brush. Uh, so to start off with, I use bristle brushes because they're a little uh, harder and they can hold more paint initially. And as I progress, then I use softer brushes, and I'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, but the brush is with paint and a little bit of paint thinner, so the consistency is probably about 95% paint, 5% paint thinner. But I do use a little bit of paint thinner because I like to have a consistency somewhat like charcoal. Um, so I like my drawing brush to be a, a little messy, but I want to be able to at least make a mark with it because if I have too much paint thinner, then the paint will start to slip off of the surface, and I don't really want that. So now that I have the outside shape roughly established, I'm going to pick up another brush, which is a Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. Um, and this is my favorite kind of brush. It's a mix between bristle and synthetic. Um, but I switch to this brush as soon as I have the outside shape established. And it's a rather smooth brush, but it's not too smooth. And I find that it works best on panel. Um, so I'm working on a 12 by 16 gessoed panel and it's toned with neutral gray acrylic paint. But I find that this brush actually works really well on that kind of surface. All right, thus far we have the outside shape of the head and the axis of the eyes and the nose somewhat established and we just painted in a, a warm neutral color for the cast shadow of the face. And I'm gonna go in with a dark value to continue to draw out the outside shape of the face, but it's important for me to note that this isn't straight black. Um, this is a ivory black with burnt umber, raw umber, and a little bit of alizarin crimson. Um, so I just, I don't want it to be straight black because anything that's straight black or straight white tends to pop out and the background something that I really want to, to fade back. And this was really something that I kind of had in my head that I wanted this painting to have this dark warm background because of the the model um, man with a beard a very very inspirational portrait I could see it right away so that's another thing I should probably talk about sometimes I just see the painting before I create it uh, whenever I look at a particular model or a scene sometimes it just I just see it like a flash in my head and that's usually a good sign that it drop whatever I'm doing in paint because those instances don't really last very long. Alright, let's talk about what I'm doing as far as the color is concerned. So the cast shadow was initially a warmer dark color and then as I painted the background in I see I saw that it was a little too warm so I introduced a little bit of the sap green with some of the yellow ochre into the mix for the cast shadow and I didn't want the cast shadow to be straight green or straight brown or anything like that. Um, so it's a work in progress, the color for the cast shadow. Um, but I like to let the colors evolve as I go. And remember always that in realism or in accuracy of likeness or, or what have you, it's not really the color that'll do it right away. It's the values and the shapes. So if you can get the shapes right, and get the values right then things will start to work so I've just mixed up a neutral gray for the background um, now I know you're probably thinking he has browns and grays so this is gonna be a brown and gray painting uh, but I'm just trying to get the canvas covered I know that the hair is a little bit cooler relative to the cast shadow of the face so that's all I have as far as colors are concerned. I'm just relating that cast shadow of the face and the shadow of the hair. His hair is gray um, and the light source is a warm light source. So that's all I have really. I just have the coolness of the shadow of the hair contrasting the 
warmness of the cast shadow of the side of the face. And with my dark background color, I just indicated where the ear, where I believe the ear is going to go. Um, so sometimes I just use the same brush that I had and I like to organize my brushes such that I have a brush for the beard, I have the brush for the background, I have a brush for the cast shadow of the face, and then a brush for the colors of the face and the light. Um, so I like to organize my brushes like that, but you'll see how I organize my brushes later on in this demo. Alright, so I should note another little recent development in my approach to portrait painting. Um, I don't always like to paint things the same way. I like to explore. I like to figure different ways of doing different things. Um, but I found that keeping a halftone brush or a brush designed to fit in between the shadow and the light, um, in particular the dark light, which is the light closest to the shadow. Um, so I have a brush that I've started to designate for that particular value on the face and it's really just something that helps me in terms of time um, so keeping that brush designated for that half tone is pretty useful for me as far as timing is concerned it actually cuts quite a bit of time in terms of the the mixtures and whatnot um, so what I do is I have a general shape for the shadow side of the face and then with that general shape I go in with the brush designated for the half tone of the dark light and then I start to draw out that shape more and more and the accuracy comes from that so the accuracy comes from sculpting these forms one after the other all right now we've switched brush to a brush that I'm going to designate for the light side of the face and I'm mixing something that I like to call a false color. Um, so the false color for me is typically warmer and a little bit darker than what I want the true color to be. I don't try to mix the true color right away um, but I try to mix something that is kind of in a predetermined fashion such that I can build the more elaborate colors and values on top of so I go a little bit warmer in the beginning because as I work up in values I introduce more and more white and I work darker because I want to have more of a middle range to either go up or go down in value so I designate up as lighter in the value scale and down as darker in the value scale. So now that I've mixed up that color for the false color, or the first color pass, if you will, of the flesh colors and flesh tones, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the consistency of what is going on as far as the paint thinner and paint is concerned. So um, remember when I started off I had the 90, well, I said something like 95% paint, 5% paint thinner for the drawing brush, and that still pretty much holds true for the first pass of the color but I'm trying to be a little bit more thin with it so as I cover uh, the first layer of paint on the surface with my flesh color brush I really want to be kind of whispering the paint on I don't want to put it too gashly onto the surface I don't want to use too much paint right away uh, because I want to have room to draw on top of this and further articulate the colors and the values because I know I cannot mix the correct value right away. I need something down to relate and I need things to relate to in order to make better decisions in the future. So as far as accuracy is concerned, the only thing that matters for me is the outside shape of the face having that well established and the center line. So I, I want a center line that's pretty close to the final decision of where I want my center line to be. Uh, so what that means is I want to know exactly how three-quarter the head is or how far in profile or how centered is the head 
and that's about it that, that's about it with the accuracy and as I fill in this paint rather thin and I'm kind of whispering it onto the surface I'm going to be covering over the marks that I made for the drawing of the axis of the eyes and the axis of the nose because that was only a general shape to get me going so now I'm going to be able to further develop that so now I'm going to be picking up the brush that I used to initially draw with and I'm going to designate this as the brush that I'll use for the beard um, so it's going to be a mixture of white and a little bit of raw umber that I already had on the brush um, but I'm going to warm it up with a little bit of the, the flesh tone mixtures um, so white and light or well his beard's not exactly white it's more of like a light gray but it's something that I want to get my first guess I don't want to spend too much time thinking of what color is that exactly no 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 I want to think of what is that value and what is my first glance of that color um, so my, at first glance is gray I, I'm not going to argue with too much complexity in my head I see gray I'm sorry now gray and what matters to me is the value the value is lighter than the the flesh tones it's lighter than the background it's lighter than everything else it's the lightest mass but I'm not gonna start out overly light I'm starting out kind of in a middle range because I know that I'm going to build on top of that and I should probably mention that this is a direct painting or an alla prima type approach to portrait painting but it should be noted that in any step here I could stop and let it dry so suppose that I'm painting in a group and I only had an hour or two hours to paint it's okay if a layer dries it's fine it only affects the edges um, so the beard at first glance it was gray and that's all I'm going to consider as far as the color is concerned I didn't see his beard pink I didn't see it green or anything like that I just saw gray I went with gray and the value was lighter than any of the other big shapes that's about it that's all that's going on in my head right now and I'm just feeling the paint as I go not too thick and not too thin of the same consistency that I mentioned earlier with the flesh tones I'm just whispering the paint on so to speak because I know that I will be building on top of it and creating more and more values now oil painting in particular has this property to reflect light um, so that creates a glare and um, as far as photography is concerned that's probably the largest problem in photographing painting is getting rid of the glare um, but for me to to paint I don't want to have too much glare so what I use is a large flat fan brush so it's pretty much just a cheap synthetic acrylic brush I think and I just use it to just lightly push the paint in a particular direction and if I find a direction to push that minimizes the glare I just stick with that going back to the brush that I designated for the cast shadow of the face I just loaded it with a little bit more of the raw umber and then used a little more of the gray to neutralize the the raw umber the gray from the beard so yes I do take from some puddles that already mixed on my palette alright so now I'm gonna take this brush and I'm going to go back to the painting and just solidify the cast shadow of the face a little bit more so all I really have as far as the face is concerned is the outside shape general placements for the features and the light and shadow so now with the shadow brush I will be drawing out the more specific shape for the cast shadow of the face and then I'll also use this to make little marks here and there to draw with you'll often see me switch quite rapidly between brushes um, I don't know if you noticed I switched right into my 
half tone brush or my dark light brush and I I'm using it as I mentioned before just to sculpt out the shadow shape a little bit more accurately but it also creates a plane now uh, so what's a plane a plane is a conceptualized idea of a flat surface in three-dimensional space what does that mean think about it as a flat sheet of paper at some angle whatever angle you want relative to a light source so what does that do as far as a painting is concerned so the plane is the value change that's it the plane is a value change so a shape that's a little bit lighter or darker in the light side of the face is a plane change and that's all it is the plane change is lighter or it's darker based on its relation to the light source All right, back to the cast shadow brush for the side of the face. I'm using it now to make yet another mark for the axis of the eyes, um, more specifically the eyes themselves now, and the eyebrows. Uh, so I'm really going to make a mark, make two marks that is, for the eyes and compare them to each other using horizontal lines from one eye to the other. So the eye to the right side of the surface is a little higher than the left, but it's not that much higher. Just a little bit. Just a little higher. And this also takes to perspective of uh, where am I in perspective to the model. But not to overcomplicate it, just make a mark for the eye and make a mark for the other eye and then compare where they are using a horizontal line relative to each other. So that gets you going in terms of where the eyes are in relation to each other. The next thing to really worry about is the further development of the eyes and I'll talk about that later. I'll show you how I render out the eyes. Um, so with the light brush, so the brush with the value of the color of the face, I'm just using it to lightly sketch the shape of the ear. Now I don't want too much of a light in the shadow so I'll go back into it with the shadow brush so oftentimes I'll mix on the surface as well so I used the values that were already on the light brush and the shadow brush to create that value for the ear so here we are still less than 30 minutes in this painting demonstration and I've, I've made marks for the axis of the eyes and I've made marks for pretty much just a brush mark per eye at the moment and for the nose and that's really the simplicity that I want to be at because that really reads from far away and it helps me see where my mistakes are and in the future it'll help me correct my mistakes if my shapes are simple and believe me I make mistakes I'm gonna definitely make mistakes and sometimes you don't really see your mistakes right away it's kind of like a word search they're right in front of you but you don't really see them because you're looking into it too much. Um, so even if you're doing an alla prima painting, uh, meaning you're doing a painting in one sitting or in one day, it's oftentimes very beneficial to step back for a few minutes or go out to lunch or something and then you can come back and get a fresh eye and see where your mistakes are. And in portrait painting, or in painting in general, if you keep your painting simple, it's often just a few brush marks that you'll need in order to make corrections. Just a few marks really can make a big difference in terms of a portrait painting. Alright, let's talk a little bit about the medium that I use. Um, so, as you recall, I use a 1 fifth stand oil to 4 fifths paint thinner mixture. And you see me, you've seen me quite often dab into it and then go to my paper towel. But look at the consistency of the paint. It's somewhat fluid, right? But it's not particularly runny or anything like that. So, stand oil is a thickener and paint thinner is a thinner. And stand oil also has a property, and perhaps this is why it's named stand oil, uh, that it makes the paint stay wet longer. Um, so this is very beneficial to me um, 
because oftentimes I'll work an, an entire day on a painting. Uh, sometimes I'll come back six hours later and it's still wet and I'm still able to work on it. It's extremely useful, at least to me, to stand back and squint or stand back and blur my eyes or stand back and look rapidly back and forth between the model and the painting because it really helps me get that perspective of what the painting actually looks like. And at least to me, I think that it's important to spend your time developing the big picture. Uh, that's what people will see when they walk past your painting in a museum or in a gallery. Or even if you submit the painting, a picture of the painting to a competition, they will see the thumbnail. Um, so the thumbnail is like the painting far away. It's the big picture. So you really want to develop the big picture because it's pretty much the first impression that people will get. And once they've been drawn into the painting by the big picture, then they can see all the little details inside or all the smaller shapes. But it's really the big picture that will drive them to the painting. All right, so now we're moving one up lighter in the face, meaning that we're going even lighter now. So initially I had the light in the shadow and the dark light, so the half tone closest to the shadow. Those were the three values that I had. Now I'm introducing yet another value, a lighter value on the face that is going to help me sculpt out the mid-tones and sculpt out the more intricate planes. Remember the plane is just indicated by the value change. So that's all I've done. I've just added in another value to help me sculpt out the forms a little more accurately. So making a mark and then stepping back, mixing, making a mark, and then stepping back is usually the rhythm to which I paint. And I really, I really try to stand back as often as possible because you don't even notice from far away that the two eyes are still just single brush marks. Um, so it's really kind of an art of illusion in a sense, trying to get the painting to resemble the model. And at least to me, it's really about keeping that simplicity as long as possible and making it as accurate as possible. So remember, we started off very general and Remember I said start with something and create something of which you can work on top of. So now as promised we're working on top of that. So we're taking the foundation that we laid down and now we're going to make more and more intricate shapes on top of them. Remember that beard was, I said it was gray at first and that's what I went with and I painted it initially a little bit darker. Well now I'm going back in with yet another lighter mixture or a lighter variant of that gray and I'm sculpting on even more planes now. Remember the plane is just a value change, that's all it is. And it's lighter because it's facing the light more and that's all there is to it. I oftentimes mix values right next to each other on the palette before I put them onto the the surface, but I also designate the value to the brush. Um, now remember, I already mentioned that I have a value for the dark light or the half tone closest to the shadow. So I've just made that a touch warmer um, than it was before. And now I'm going to do the same thing with the light brush of the skin, introducing just a little bit of a lizard and crimson. So now I have these two brushes next to each other and I'm going to swap between the two brushes to further articulate the shapes on the face. So now we're going to be sculpting even more and more accurate shapes. And remember, I couldn't have, I could not have done this if I didn't start out simply and start out with something easy enough for me to understand so that I can work with. So as far as the value is concerned now, I'm using my half tone brush or my dark light brush to further delineate the shape of the side of the face and the side of the nose. And I tend to work on a patch of paint on the painting multiple times. I won't just make a brush mark and leave it, although sometimes I do 
and that can be a lot of fun but I really try to make a mark stand back and see what that shape is like in relation to the model and now I'm going to be switching to the light brush so with the, the light brush then I'll go and I'll further draw out that shape so I pushed the shadow shape of the nose a little bit further than it needed to be with the dark light brush intentionally so that I could come back in and create a softer transition between the, the shadow and the light on the nose with the brush with the light color of the face. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just working back and forth between the two brushes trying to work out the edge between those two shapes and then I will put more specificity to that nose later on. I want that light brush to be just a little bit warmer and more pink so I'm going to add just a little bit more alizarin crimson to the mixture in order to get a, a darker and a more a pinkish flesh tone now. With that more pink variation of the, the flesh color mixture, I'm then going to be rolling it across the bottom of the nose and I'll be using the paint that's already on the painting to create a gradation of value. So I'm making a rounded general shape for the nose. I'm treating this kind of like a block of clay. And going back in with the shadow brush, I'm sculpting out the shadow shape underneath of the nose a little bit more. And I'm trying to articulate it a little bit more with each brush mark, but I'm still trying to keep that simplicity. I want an economy of means. Um, so what that means is, I want to say the most that I possibly can with the least I possibly can so that I can optimize the amount of information that I can display within the spectrum of shapes that I'm creating. So all that means is that as I develop this painting further and further, I'm trying to give that simplicity and elegance that I gave to the bigger shapes into the smaller shapes. So I'm trying to give the smaller shapes just as much respect as the bigger shapes by making them as simple as possible and relating them to each other. Starting out with that warmer, more neutral valued middle ground for the first pass of the, the flesh really, really helps me obtain that larger spectrum of tonality on the face. and. It's the same thing with the beard. I'm not going to discriminate the beard. Um, I'm going to treat the beard with the same amount of respect in terms of the, the structure of it. Um, so I'm going to look for planes. I'm going to look for gradations of value on the beard. And in the future, we're going to play with the texture as well. Um, so it's really just about treating the shapes as simply as possible. and as accurately as possible and I made a mistake I made the nose too far down I'm not gonna hide that from you so I'm using the same brush for the for the beard to push that shadow up remember I said keeping the shapes as simple as possible as long as possible it helps you fix the mistakes and it was so simple to push the shadow of the nose up so oftentimes when I catch a drawing error on my painting I can easily fix it with a few brush marks and at the same time I can further articulate it more. Initially I had the nose too far down, so I moved it up using the shape of the, the mustache right above the beard. And now with the flesh color mixture, I can now make a more accurate shape for the side of the nose into the cheek. Going back into my shadow brush, I can then 
create an accent for the nostril that you'll see in a little bit slightly above the nose where that change had occurred see it was literally two or three brush marks that I needed to push that nose up so that's really that's my ideal honestly in painting is to make life more simple for myself and make it as relaxing of a process as possible it could just be my personality I just want the painting to flow I want it to be as relaxing as it can be and I don't really want to think about time as well I don't want to think about am I going to complete this painting in two hours and three hours or two days or three days because in the end of the day or in the end of the painting it's not going to matter as much how long it took you to create the painting um, so it's just my point of view to make the process as simple and easy to understand because it's just more relaxing for me so what I've just done now as far as the painting is concerned I mixed up a, a generic value scale of basic flesh tones the lighter portion is a little more on the yellow the mid tones are a little more pink and red um, so when I get into multiple values on the face multiple meaning I'll extend the entire value scale I like to have that tonality on my palette so that I can have something to relate to on my palette as I paint onto the surface the idea being that the organization on the palette will reflect on the painting So having just placed that mark for the what I believe will be the lightest region on the face, I'm then going to work right next to it. I like to paint my values side by side next to each other um, with another value that's not as bright. Um, and it's actually the value that I had already mixed on my palette. You saw me mix the basic value scale. And I just tinted it with a little bit more of the cadmium red because I needed it to be a little bit warmer and that's all I did I just dabbed it in a tad bit more of the cadmium red and notice as I continue to develop the painting I introduce more and more paint uh, so I, as I go I make the paint more and more thick um, because I try to build that surface as I go and using my stand oil to paint thinner mixture it really helps me work in this way because the paint stays wet for longer periods of time so here we are nearly 40 minutes in the painting demonstration and it's still pretty pretty much wet it's only really going to be a little bit different perhaps an hour or so into the painting and that really all depends on how much paint thinner you use uh, so the more paint thinner you use the more rapid the drying time will be working back into the middle tone range on my palette I'm going to be using my light brush to create a more of a grayed pink, a little bit on the orange side. Uh, so it was basically, you could say, a mixture of alizarin crimson, cadmium orange, lead white, and a little bit of raw umber as a coolant. Um, so let's talk about the lead white. I've been using the lead white recently for the past two or three videos, I believe. Um, so the lead white is it's a white that's more transparent so it holds the color of the or it holds the pigment more than the titanium white the titanium white is kind of has more of a it it blasts the color it blasts the value so it's great to get your values brighter uh, more quickly and i tend to use more titanium white anyway but to get into more subtle mixtures where you don't want the paint to get too blasted out, I do recommend using a more of a um, transparent white. And that's what the, the lead white is to me. So the lead white that I'm using is the zinc white from Winsor & Newton. What I used to use before, if you watched my previous videos, was a flake white replacement from Gamblin. And I, I really liked it, but I just wanted to experiment. I don't like using the same 
methodologies are the same things all the time. Well, so as far as the painting is concerned, I pretty much took the color from the beard uh, to paint in the white of the eye known as the sclera. Uh, now remember the white of the eye is not white and in this case the, the lighter region of his eye is not really facing the light too much so it's a, a middle value that's actually a little bit darker than the area surrounding of the, the face. Um, so now we're going to be introducing more values into the eyes. So I painted in that mass of light color first and so now I'm going back in with the drawing color to make some marks for where the tear ducts are going to be. Using a horizontal line I'm going to be now gauging what precisely is the difference in height from the eye to the left corner of the canvas to the eye of the right corner of the canvas. Alright, so here we are 41 minutes into this video and now we're going to be getting into putting more information into the eyes. Uh, now remember the first thing I did for the eye was to just put a brush mark. Uh, put a brush mark in the direction or in the place where I think it's going to be and then you saw me paint in the flat value for the, the sclera of the eye and now I just made a mark for the pupil. And uh, so I should let it be known that I'm using just my drawing color at the moment to put in the darks. Um, so that is, I'm just using raw umber, and that's all I'm using to put in marks for the upper eyelids and the lower eyelids and the pupil. Um, so you can count them like one, two, three, three different lines for the shape of the eye. And that's all I have, and even as I start to subdivide the shapes into smaller shapes, I'm still trying to maintain that simplicity and that economy of means so that I can get more out of each brush stroke that I put down. And as far as the light is concerned, the lighter values, I'm just using the already pre-mixed values that I had for the flesh. Um, so in a sense, I am pri prioritizing the drawing and the values um, because I feel that if I can get my drawing right, so that is if I can get the shapes right and if I can get the values working relative to each other it's just a matter of tweaking the colors a little bit. You can always change a color or at least I believe that you can always change a color with more facility than you can an entire shape or an entire value. Again, with my designated shadow brush, I'm starting to articulate the eyebrows a little more. Um, so this model in particular has a little bit thicker eyebrows. Um, so that's, that's kind of fun to move the eyebrows around. And as far as expression is concerned, um, the eyebrows raised up, as you can tell, is going to be more of a fearful look. Um, the eyebrows raised down would be more of an angry, aggressive look. Uh, so for expression, um, since I do work a lot from life, I don't really try to paint expressions that are too exaggerated, although they are pretty fun to attempt. But I usually have my models in a very a calm and relaxed manner when I paint them. And I think that their true expression really shows when they just sit and reflect. You can almost see into what they're thinking or how they're feeling in that particular day. All right, let's mix up a color for the glasses. Uh, I'm actually gonna mix two. So I'm gonna have the dark for the glasses, so the, the shadow and the darker reflective side of the glasses. I'm gonna use just raw umber and yellow ochre for that. Now getting my smaller light brush, I'm going to mix the light portion of the glasses, so just the little lights that are going to be sticking by. So I just ran my brush through my cadmium yellow, yellow ochre, and cadmium orange, and that was it. And I'm using a little bit of my lead white to 
make that value a little bit lighter but I'm not trying to lose the saturation of that color so that's why I chose the lead white so now that I have these two colors mixed up I'm now going to start to draw the glasses All right, let's talk about the glasses. Uh, you saw me mix the light brush and the dark brush. So what I'm gonna try to do with these glasses is make a mark for the middle where I think it's going to be resting on the nose first. And then I'll make two marks, one mark for the left corner of the glasses and one mark for the right corner of the glasses. And that will give me the dimensions of the glasses so I have a mark for the middle resting on the nose and then the two corners if I mess up at all I'll just use my flesh color brush as I just did to move the mark a little bit further and I like to get the dark accents for the glasses and the light accents I really really like that effect in a lot of paintings that I've seen where the glasses are simply just a few touches of dark and light but to get that kind of effect, you really have to stand back and make a mark and evaluate whether that mark is necessary to the overall structure and appearance of the glasses on the model's face. Uh, so that is really an effect that you can get by standing back, making a mark, and then standing back. What I'm talking about is having the glasses appear three-dimensionally on the model's face, utilizing just a few marks for the darks and the lights and of course the cast shadow the cast shadow resting underneath of the glasses I'm going to make the cast shadow uh, rather simple here as you just saw me make that mark with the dark value on the brush just simply rolling across the bottom side of the glasses I feel like I get the most fun out of painting whenever I make a brush mark, whenever I physically apply paint onto a surface and it just harmonizes. I can't explain how that happens, I can't explain why that happens. There is a lot of feeling that's involved in it. Feeling is a kind of a subjective thing, I can't really talk about how to do something with tons of feeling, it's something that you just have to feel out, so to speak. Uh, for me, that really happened in this painting with the highlights of the glasses. Putting in, sprinkling in those highlights, just little touches of light and dark here and there. And then I stand back and then the glasses are there. With such simplicity and such facility, that to me is a whole lot of fun. It's definitely quite an experience to see that appear right in front of me with just a few touches of paint. Remember that value scale that I mixed on my palette so that I could have a, a relation of the values and colors on the palette before putting them on the painting? Yeah, so I'm going to utilize that now uh, to its full extent, really. I've just mixed a middle tone value with my tiny dark brush, and with my light brush I just slightly dipped it into some more of the cadmium yellow, and now we're going to get into what is a little bit beyond just a few brush marks. 
though to me the word a few is relative right a few brush marks could be however many you want but now that we're going to go a little more up there in the value scale we're going to now be utilizing more values okay now that i have the canvas completely covered i have all my big shapes and my so-called middle shapes and i've worked the half tones now i'm going to be spending less time actually mixing and more time bringing values up or pushing them down on the painting using a light brush and a dark brush just a tiny one remember what i said the plane change is indicated by the value change so that effect of a three-dimensional plane in space will read on your surface if you moderate the values if you adjust the values a little by little relative to each other and based on your understanding of the structure the three-dimensional structure in space you can push values lighter push values darker thus creating more and more planes but those planes are demonstrated by the value changes so that's why i'm really not going to spend a lot of time mixing Instead, I'm going to be taking the values from my palette and either pushing something one up or one down. So that one up or one down just means I'm going to be moving something lighter or moving something darker. As you've seen me already create a couple new tiny plane changes between the forms around the eyes. I have plane changes now for the eyelid. I have a plane change for the corner of the eye socket and now I'm going to the other eye socket to create yet another plane change. There is a lot of subtlety in the darks just as you creep into the shadow. There's a lot of subtlety into the darks just as you move closer and closer to the shadow. It, that is in my opinion where the most subtlety happens is when you get closer and closer to the form shadows. That is the form shadow of the side of the nose. Uh, so a little vocabulary here. So for me, a form shadow is a shadow from a form inside of another form or on top of another form. So the nose for me is a subform. You know, the form of the nose rests on the form of the entire face. Um, so that's just a little vocabulary there. But as I mentioned, the Subtlety really really happens as you approach your values closer and closer to the form shadows and in the cast shadows really. I'm using the paint that's already on the surface to help me create more of a value gradation. Remember I started out a little bit darker and warmer so that I can build up the values and that's what's going on right now. I'm either building the values up or I'm making them darker. But with some of the values I've made darker utilizing the paint that was already on the surface. As you can see on the corner of the eye left of the panel. And I'm doing it again with the eyebrow on the left of the surface. I'm using the paint that was already there with the paint on my paintbrush to create that gradation of value. So I don't have to spend so much time mixing that gradation and rather have it happen quite quickly utilizing the paint that was already on there. Let's think about this a little bit like building a house. Uh, what, when you build a house you don't want to start off with a doorknob, right? Uh, so you can think about eyelids and pupils and eyelashes as doorknobs. And the outer structure of the head as the foundation of the house. Alright, so if this portrait painting is like a house, then what we did first was we established the large perimeter. So we established the framework of the house. We laid down the foundations. We laid down the, the drywall or the walls. And now we're just now going to build the doors. The doors can be thought of as the eyelids. So the eyelids are just the small forms that are resting on top of the larger form of the eye socket that we established earlier. And then the tear duct or the region 
inside of the eyes where the tears come from can be your doorknob. You may think of it as a detail, I think of it more as a structure. I think of it as a smaller structure resting on top of bigger structures. And I like to keep that mentality in my head that like, if this were a three-dimensional structure, how would I lay down the foundation? How would I follow through with its development? Alright, here we are nearly an hour into the demonstration, and if you're still hanging in there with me, thank you so much for sticking through this far. So let's get some cadmium red light, and some cadmium yellow, and the titanium white, and punch up some bright, warm value for the side of the face. I'm going to use this on the cheek now. Now I'm going to be using a little more paint and I'm going to be now making marks that are probably going to be the last marks that I'm going to make. Um, that means that each touch that I'm going to be creating now will perhaps be the final mark that I leave on the painting. I've worked up the middle values, I've worked the mid-tones, and I've created the small shapes and the larger shapes, and now I'm just going to be tinkering with the values a little bit more. Uh, so I used that cadmium red light and the yellow ochre and the titanium white the titanium white because I wanted more of a punch to the value and I just want to sculpt out the form more precisely rolling across the side of the face I'm going to be using the paint that was already on there to create that value gradation. Now remember, as I mentioned earlier, I started off warmer and darker so that I could build the lights or as I go, move up in the value scale or move down in the value scale, but it also helps me with the edges and the gradation. Just scumbling the paint on as we approach the shadow helps create a softer edge. I'm really utilizing my value scale and my palette now to figure out where my values are going to go relative to each other because I'm now reaching the point in the painting where I really want the three-dimensionality to take effect. What that means is I really want that three-dimensional effect to happen now. So to get this working, I really want to utilize the paint that I already had on the surface, as I just mentioned, and gradate the edges so that 
I have a very nice variety of soft edges rolling across the side of the face describing the curvature of the form. I mentioned earlier that the gradation or the change in the values relative to one another will occur much more rapidly on a fast curve than a slow curve. So a fast curve you can think of more like the curvature of the nostril. So imagine a line moving from one end of the nostril to the other end of the nostril. That's a fast curve. But a slow curve would be if you wrapped a line across the side of the left of the model's face just as you are on the shadow. So imagine a mark from the left side where my brush is right now to the right side of the nose. Imagine that curve, it's much more of a slow curve. So a slow curve is more flat. It's more flat than a fast curve. So a slow curve is going to have a much more subtle variety of values. If you look at a lot of old master paintings or a lot of portrait paintings, there's a great variety of value or subtle value changes but you don't see it from far away. It's that subtleness that creates that illusion of the three-dimensional form. Subtlety in the values is really something that I really enjoy creating. Um, and it's really something that happens as you progress along the painting and you work the midtones and you create more and more puddles of paint next to each other and it's it's really a lot of fun to create these subtle gradations of value and it's really all about how you handle the paint it's all about how you organize the values on your palette it's all about how you just keep it keep the values in check relative to one another all right so take a minute look at the subtlety in the gradations of the values on the cheek that I just rendered and and if this would help take a minute or take some time to practice making subtle value changes on your palette it won't hurt you to try to make these subtle gradations on your palette before you put them on the surface to me that helps me a lot to see those subtle value changes on my palette before I put them onto the surface. Um, you can really see how that influences the way that I paint. And it also is like a muscle memory because if you can mix those subtle gradations of value on your palette, then you have that muscle memory already embedded in your hand to then put forth into the painting. I mean, check out the all the little subtle value gradations that I have on the palette and how I have the values ordered from lightest to darkest and it helps me really gauge where I'm at on the value scale. Okay, so I mixed up another lighter value pretty much identical to the left side of the panel as you can see it's I'm trying to continue the form across the nose so I'm I'm picturing the continuation of the cheek of the model's cheek and I'm continuing that curve and almost ignoring the fact that there's a nose there so I'm trying to keep the structure of the cheek as though it were a continuous curve from one side of the cheek to the other side of the cheek completely ignoring the fact that there's a nose there what that means is I have the same value of the left side of the cheek as I have on the right side because they're on pretty much the same plane relative to the light pretty much as the key word they are slightly different as the cheek rolls across the side of the face should I say as the cheek turns across the side of the face but the values are so close that I simplified them into a single unit. And from far away it reads that the face is three-dimensional and is turning because of that 
continuation of the values across the nose. Alright, here we are an hour and five minutes into this video. Uh, so let, let's uh, recap what I've done so far. So I had the block in, I showed you the block in, um, so that was the initial drawing. Then I blocked in the basic shapes of light and dark, and then I started to introduce the half tones into the face, developing the structure of the face, and then I started placing the smaller shapes of the eyes and the nose and the glasses into the face. And so here we are now finishing certain portions of the face. Now finish is a relative term, so I should probably just say that I'm starting to render out forms to their completion. I completed the left side of the cheek and I am going to stand back and see if that works and then I'm going to move to the other side of the face. So I'm still working the big picture here um, but I'm introducing more and more values and colors and subtle gradations. Uh, I had to really stand back to see that the forehead wasn't receiving enough warmth. So all I really did was put a little more cadmium orange onto the light value that I already had on the higher end of the palette with the value scale. And that's all I used for this that I just placed onto the forehead. Right now I'm rendering portions, smaller portions of the face, but I'm still thinking about the big picture. I don't ever want to lose track of the big picture as I introduce more and more subtle values. And now remember when I said as you progress forward in a portrait painting, the smallest touches can make all the difference. And that really holds true. I had to the right of the surface the nose a tad bit too far to the right. Uh, so I used a straight line uh, with my brush to make that comparison and it was only just a little touch to move that a little further to the left just the tiniest touch um, so I like to do that I like to adjust things with simple marks using straight lines and that's all that there really is to adjusting a shape like that you really don't want to trap yourself in this mentality where I've painted something, I spent all this time drawing it, I'm not going to adjust it. It's just paint. Always keep that in mind. It's just paint. I can push it around. If I have something wrong, just push it. Just a brush mark here, a brush mark there. In this case I moved the nose a little bit, or I moved the the model's left nostril a little more to the left of the panel and that was it. It was a, just a touch and now I'm going in and adding a little bit more of the alizarin crimson to the nose and I'm just going to keep rendering. You can think of it as stepping forward in error. Painting should be fun. It should be something that you enjoy doing but if you're going to try to make a portrait painting that resembles the person that you're painting then there are going to be things like shape value and color that you're gonna to have to think about but keep it in a way that's fun for you don't ever trap yourself in that mentality of I made a mark I'm gonna stick with it you really gotta lower your pride or I in my opinion I constantly try to lower any kind of pride that I may have and if I have a mistake if I see it I'll adjust it I will make that brush mark and make it happen. I challenge you to not think about color too much. Uh, that's really a, a daring thing to say, but sometimes 
you really get the right color from your first impression. Sometimes your first impression of a color can be the most accurate one. Um, but then you, there's also instances where you can relate the colors relative to one another. But if you spend too much time thinking of what that particular color is, you might miss what that particular shape is or what that value needs to be relative to the, to the other values. Um, so I took a chance here with this color. I used a little bit of alizarin crimson and some of my ultramarine blue and then I tinted it with my yellow ochre for the beard. Now the beard is pretty gray and it's supposed to stay pretty gray relative to everything else. But I just tried that out. I just felt out those colors and put them on my brush and that was it. Sometimes you just have to feel out a color. Alright, back to the shadow brush. I'm going to be dipping into some of the raw umber and some ivory black back into my medium, dab it on my paper towel, and I'm going to use this mixture uh, to create what's going to be the collar. So he's he was wearing a collar in the picture, and I'll show you in a second. And I really wanted initially to just let it be a head floating in space. But then I kind of felt out that I wanted to put the collar and I'll make it work with the background. Remember I told you in the beginning that I kind of, when I saw this model in particular, I, I realized a painting that I could create and it just happened in my head. I saw this painting. Um, so the man with the beard, the dark background, and that was what I saw. But now I'm, I'm starting to envision the... Uh, the coat that he's wearing and there's a chair in the background that's slightly orange or it's pretty orange I'm going to omit, omit that chair I'm going to omit it and I'm going to let the dark of the collar and the coat blend in with the dark of the background kind of in a old master type effect so uh, here's what the actual collar looks like So I'm picturing the collar and the dark of the shirt fading into the background. I don't know why, but I kind of envision that kind of look. Um, and I've seen it in a lot of Sargent paintings or a lot of old master paintings. And it, I like that kind of effect of the, the figure in space with the face emerging in the light and the other side um, maintaining in the shadow. And I, I like to do that. And the, the collar that I painted that you can barely see is pretty much just a few touches of ivory black and burnt umber. That's all that I'm really going to use for the collar and the drapery. But from far back, it should read like a collar in space, or at least the values are so close that it shouldn't intrude into the overall design of the painting at all. Uh, 
I'm using the flesh tones that were already on my brush for the light side of the face just to scumble uh, some of the flesh color onto the bottom of the lip and just a tad bit so that you can get that kind of transparency from the beard to the mouth and then I'm going to use it again to pull out the ear just a tad bit and then I'm going to move some of the dark accents that I placed in earlier um, with the tiny shadow brush. When that's all said and done, I'm going to get a dry synthetic brush, a dry sable, or just any kind of clean light brush. Light meaning that it's not hard like a bristle, and it's, it's a very soft dry brush that I like to use uh, to further gradate my edges. Uh, so what that means is I'm just softening the edges uh, around the corners that I think need to be more soft. So that being the corners of the face just as we approach the shadow and the corners of the face just as we approach the side of the nose. And that's about it for the form. So I really like to first figure out the big shapes, then I introduce the planes as I, I talked about earlier. And then I start to render the smaller shapes. And once I have the smaller shapes rendered out, then I get this dry, synthetic, soft brush to further push the soft edges into one another. And that should complete the form. Just as I thought I was completing the forms on the, on the face, I realized that I don't really have a clear definition of the the left side of the model's forehead so um, no need to fear I just get a a brush with some of my drawing color and I make a definitive line uh, differentiating the the outside of the model's head so that's all I did right there I just had my raw umber and I drew an outline around the side of where the the head is going to be the side of the forehead and then I'm going to get my brush with the beard mixture, so the color for the beard, and that's going to be the color that I'll use for the hair. And once I have these two shapes finely delineated, then I'm going to soften the edges in between them. Um, so thus that would eliminate the line. But sometimes it's nice to leave a line in a painting as well. It could be a nice aesthetic effect too. I'm just using that same brush that I used to draw the line delineating the forehead to create a plane curving around the forehead. Remember the plane change is just indicated by the value change. And once I did that, then I'll go back to my dry soft synthetic brush to make that edge even more soft as it turns very subtly across the forehead away from the light. All right, now we have a ton of paint and raw umber, some white, and yellow ochre into the mix with this synthetic brush. And I'm going to now be putting even more little planes on the beard. Uh, so the beard is a nice area to have some fun with. As long as you maintain your light and shadow and the tonality of the beard that we introduced earlier, 
you can put as many little details or strands of hair as you like. Um, for me, I'm not going to go too wild with it, but I am going to make some brush marks show and make some little strands of hair, illustrate them with this um, flat synthetic brush. So I'm going to be making these marks here and there uh, to get the texture of the beard. With my little brush, I'm going to dip it right into the light mixture on my palette already made and paint in the highlight of the nose. Alright, after spending some time away from the painting, so from the last clip I actually uh, let the painting, I just walked away from the painting for a couple hours, I came back. Um, I like to do this so I can get a fresh eye, so I came back and I noticed that the left eye, so the model's left eye, was too big in proportion to the model's right eye, and the model's right eye looked just about, just right, so remember how I said it's just the tiniest, the smallest touches that can make all the difference, and that's what's going on here. I pretty much just took the color the colors that were already on my brush sitting on my palette. Um, so pretty much just use the gray of the the beard to work with the white of the eye, the sclera of the eye. And then I used a little bit of raw umber on my brush to paint in the accent of the eye again. And, and it really was just maybe... Alright, let's count them. So there was one brush mark to push the corner of the eye, the far corner of the eye, uh, to make it smaller. Another brush mark to push in the white of the eye correspondingly, and then another mark for the accent of the eye. So that was about three marks to shrink this eye down and make it fit relative to the other eye. That's all it took. While I still have some of the raw umber on my tiny brush, I'm just going to make a few final touches on the eyebrows and after I put these last touches on the eyebrows that should be about it. I'd like to thank you so much for following along with me on this journey. We embarked from the very first few marks to the very final marks. I showed you from my just indicating the top of the head to the bottom of the head painting in just a flat wash for the face to the final strands of hair. Thank you so much for watching this week's portrait painting demonstration and stay tuned for more weekly portrait painting videos.